like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here, uh, especially because uh, it is to celebrate the work of uh, two of my mentors. Can you hear me now? Okay. So uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'm very, very happy to be here, and I'm, uh, it's an honor for me to speak here. And I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity, especially because uh, it's to celebrate uh, the work of two of my mentors, uh, Krishnamurti and Chandan. And my association goes back uh, with, uh, with Krishnan Chandan goes back 24 years. Uh, uh, in fact, right about this time, uh, 24 years ago, I was doing a summer project with Chandan on uh, uh, vortex spinning in type 2 superconductors. And uh, I did a summer project uh, the next year in 1995 with Krishnamurti. Uh, that was on uh, slave boson theory. And then I continued with him uh, for a PhD. And uh, after that, I joined for a postdoc with David. So, <coughs> um, and Krish has had, uh, Krish has played a role uh, much more than that of a, a supervisor, that of a thesis supervisor. Uh, so, uh, among many things, he has actually financially supported me as well because in the second year I was uh, financially broke and I, had, I was almost about to leave my PhD and he supported me financially and uh, also took me for a sabbatical in the US along with him. So that actually helped a lot. Uh, even later on, uh, there were some domestic problems and I had to move out and he actually got me house in IASC. So that also helped me a lot and I was... Uh, sort of saved from being homeless. So he has played uh, a role of, uh, I mean, much more than that of a thesis supervisor. Even later on, whenever I've had any problems in my career, I have gone to him, I've spoken to him, I've gotten a lot of wisdom, and uh, he has never given me a solution, but he has given me the options. And he has said, okay, so the main thing that he says is, okay, these are the options. Whatever you choose, there's going to be consequences, and they come along uh, with the option that you choose. So it's up to you to choose what you want to choose. Okay. So uh, with this, I would like to begin the work. And uh, frankly speaking, I'm very nervous because uh, I mean there are many experts in this audience on the mod transition. And uh, this is some work that we did uh, one and a half years ago, and it's still in progress. I mean, uh, one of uh, we have published uh, some part of this, uh, and there is still a lot of work to be done. Um, Okay, so let me begin. <coughs> okay, so um, yeah. <coughs> so I'm going to be talking about the mod transition, and uh, want to show you a new model system that we have come up with, which shows continuous mod transition. So I'll give you the background, and then some uh, experimental background, some theory background, and also then some of our work. <clears throat> okay, so this is the outline. That is, I'll begin with the mod transition, as I said. I'll uh, give you a brief overview of the experiments in this field, the old ones and the new ones, then the theory, and then I'll describe the model system that we have come up with, and a few analytical results on that, and then the framework with which we solve the model numerically, and then go on to some more analytical results, give you the numerical results, and then some discussion, and finally conclude. So these are some of the old experiments on the mod transition. Uh, this is a classic system, vanadium sesquioxide, B2O3, where uh, the phase diagram here, which is temperature versus chemical pressure, shows these three separate phases. This is a paramagnetic insulator, this is a paramagnetic metal, and it's an antiferromagnetic insulator. And these are first order lines, which end in a critical point. And the transitions here are really dramatic, which you see here with log of resistivity as a function of inverse temperature. And you see many orders of magnitude change in resistivity. In fact, the experimentalists report that at these points where this transition happens, the crystal actually cracks and there's a, a big sound. And uh, these are old experiments, but the same experiments were repeated in 2003 by the same group. Uh, Lim uh, George Honig was the sample, uh, was the, I mean, in his lab, the sample was prepared. And what you see here is again pressure, temperature, and resistivity conductivity in fact, and uh, if you sweep through the pressures, then you see hysteresis. And what they report is that they can uh, go as slow as they, uh, as they can, but still the hysteresis remains. So they cannot really shrink the hysteresis curves to zero 
no matter how slow they go in pressure or in temperature. So, uh, here I guess the resistivity changes from being, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, decreasing to increasing. So, this seems, yeah, yeah. <coughs> right. And uh, uh, across this, then you can, um, meaning there is a finite temperature critical point here as well. And if you go from here to here, then you can see an inflection point. Okay, so uh, this is another experiment on a 2D organic salt. This is a slightly older version of the experiment in 2005. And uh, what you see here are these dimers, and these dimers have one hole each, so it's like a half filled band separated by the insulating anion layers. And this shows a very rich uh, phase diagram. In fact, there are three materials shown here. This is a paramagnetic mod insulator which goes into an antiferromagnetic uh, insulator. This is temperature and pressure. And this is a different material which shows, uh, again, unconventional superconductivity at low temperatures, but it's a paramagnetic metal at high temperature. And uh, again, you see hysteresis as a function of pressure. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that you see first order mod transitions in these systems. Now, this is a very recent experiment, 2015, where they have considered, again, three different systems. And uh, what you see is that at high pressure and low pressure, uh, there are two different phases. So, it's a superconductor to begin with, but then, uh, I mean, a quantum spin liquid mod insulator to begin with at low pressure. And as you increase pressure, you could go into superconducting phase. And this is actually, uh, I mean, um, so here is what you see is a, a typical mod transition because it goes from a quantum spin liquid mod insulator into a paramagnetic metal as a function of pressure. And uh, in this system, uh, they speculate that there is a quantum critical mod transition because the critical point seems to be at t equal to zero. Whereas in these two, they find the critical point to be at a finite temperature. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, this is another experiment on bilayer helium where they have again seen uh, mod transition, which is, um, which is extrapolated to t equal to zero. Uh, and this is as a function of the coverage of the helium, 2D helium layer. Okay, so uh, coming to theory, the um, most simplest model which describes the mod transition is the Hubbard model. And the Hubbard model can be described in very simple terms as a kinetic energy term plus a potential energy term. The kinetic energy term is basically hopping on a nearest, uh, hopping which is nearest neighbor hopping. And the uh, potential energy term is an on-site Coulomb repulsion between the up and down spin electrons. And this is, uh, this model represents a competition between delocalization due to the hopping versus the mod localization due to the on-site Coulomb repulsion. And there has been a lot of work on this model since uh, many decades. This is some older work using dynamical mean field theory in 1996, 1996 using an approximation called iterated perturbation theory. So what you see here is the density of states as a function of energy. And this is the ratio of the interaction strength to bandwidth. And as you increase the interaction strength from u by d equal to 1 to u by d equal to 4, you see that the bad band which was broad and featureless starts to develop a three peak kind of a structure. And the central peak shrinks in width and uh, uh, finally disappears, giving you a mod insulator. And if you uh, sweep through this back, you will find that the transition back from the mod insulator to metal happens at a different u over d. So this is again a first order mod transition that is seen in the particle symmetric Hubbard model. D is the bandwidth. And uh, this is a more recent work by Dobroselvik group, where this is the ratio of T over Tc. Tc is the critical point. Uh, which is a finite temperature critical point. And this is U over UC. You see there are two different U criticals, UC1 and UC2. And these two represent the spinodals. And this uh, region between them is a coexistence region where you can find both metallic and insulating solutions to coexist. And the uh, uh, low U region, the low interaction region is a Fermi liquid. And as you sweep the interaction strength, you get a mod insulator. But if you sweep back, the mod insulator turns into a Fermi liquid at a lower U critical. So again, this is a first order transition. And you see hysteresis as a function of interaction strength. Uh, there have been uh, many other works as well. Uh, recently, there was a work by Matthew Fisher's group where they showed that they took an extended Hubbard model on a triangular lattice. 
and they showed that there is a continuous mod transition between a metal and a quantum spin liquid. Then in 2015, again, Dobre Selvig's group showed that there is, uh, in the doped Hubbard model, you can see uh, quantum critical behavior at finite temperature using continuous time quantum Monte Carlo. And we also did similar work and uh, we showed that, uh, uh, we showed that the quantum critical behavior occurs in the susceptibility as well. And you can see a clear omega over T scaling, which is a characteristic signature of quantum criticality. So, uh, <coughs> uh, recently David has also published a lot of work on this. And uh, uh, <coughs> what he has shown is uh, represented in these two phase diagrams. So what you see here is asymmetry from the particle uh, so uh, the more the asymmetry is the more you are moving away from the particle or symmetric limit and this is interaction strength so as you increase the interaction strength at the particle or symmetric limit you get two critical u values which again represents a first order transition but then if you move away from particle or asymmetry being at half filling you would get a continuous mod transition as u tends to infinity please correct me david if i'm, if I'm wrong so, and this is the periodic Anderson model, which is a slight variant of the Hubbard model where it's a two orbital model and one of the orbitals is correlated, the other orbital is not and there's a hybridization between the two orbitals. I'll come to that in a, in a bit. And here what you see again is that as a function of interaction strength, if you are strictly at the particular symmetric limit, there is no more transition and the Mott insulator occurs only in this, uh, in this range where the epsilon C has to be non-zero, which is the center of the conduction band. Okay, so the abstract of this theory and experimental background is that the particle hole symmetric one band Hubbard model and the periodic Anderson model, they exhibit first order mod transitions at zero temperature. And uh, the essence of our work is that we have found a slight variant of these models that shows at particle hole symmetry a whole surface of continuous mod transitions at zero temperature. Okay, so the model that uh, is, uh, that we are going to present is most simply represented as a bilayer model where one of the layers is a condo insulator and the other layer is a metal. And there is hopping between the two which is directly from top to bottom. This is one way to visualize this model. I will come to another way to, I will come to another way in which we can visualize this model uh, which will be a more 3D version of the same model. Okay, so before we go ahead, uh, there uh, are probably students in the audience and there are also people from the, um, from the other non-quantum mechanical background who might be interested in knowing what's a condo insulator. So let me go briefly into what is a condo insulator. And uh, uh, before doing that, I mean, I'm just uh, recapitulating here a small subset of what uh, kind of insulators we know of. So insulators due to electron ion interaction, for example, the band insulators, the usual uh, Bloch-Wilson band insulators. Then there could be a piles insulator, for example, uh, uh, with a static lattice distortion. Then uh, an Anderson insulator, which is disordered induced. And then there could be electron-electron interaction induced insulators, for example, Mott-Hubbard insulators, of which examples are here, Mott-Heisenberg insulators, transition metal oxides, high TCQ phase. So among these, the condo insulators have not appeared. But actually, condo insulators are nothing but the same band insulators, but in a different avatar. Basically, they are renormalized strongly and they are band insulators to begin with. They are renormalized strongly due to strong electron electron interactions. So, there would be a band gap if there, there would be a normal, uh, like silicon like band gap in these systems if there were no electron electron interactions. But because of these strong interactions, the gap gets strongly renormalized and you see gaps which are of the order of milli electron volts rather than electron volts which you see in normal semiconductors. And these are some of the examples here. And what you see is typical is that you see that there are these 4F and uh, 5F systems, rare earth lanthanides and actinides which show this kind of behavior. Okay. So the uh, 4F and 5F participating in these, uh, in the dynamics basically tells you that strong electron-electron interactions are very important in these systems. Okay. More formally, I, we can write down a Hamiltonian, which is like a two-orbital model, where one of the orbitals is not, uh, where the electrons occupying one of the orbitals cannot hop to the next unit cell, whereas the conduction orbital is, uh, the electron occupying the conduction orbital is free to hop throughout the lattice. And there is a hybridization between the two, which allows the 
localized f electron to escape into the lattice. And there is a on site interaction u which is present only for the f electrons and not for the c electrons, not for the conduction electrons. So, this is the periodic Anderson model and if you restrict yourself to a, a total filling of 2, what you would get is a condo insulator and if you go away from half filling, then you would get a heavy fermion metal. And the gap here is uh, an indirect gap, okay. So, the condo insulator has an indirect gap and the direct gap is much bigger than the indirect gap, okay. So, with this introduction, uh, we will go back to the bilayer condo insulator metal model. And what I am showing here is that the top layer is a condo insulator, which means already there are two orbitals in this model, in this layer. And the two orbitals, of the two orbitals, one of them is a correlated orbital and the second one is an uncorrelated orbital, both of which hybridize with each other. And the bottom layer is a normal metal, which is uncorrelated metal, okay. So, this is the formal representation of that in second quantized notation. So, again you see the same periodic Anderson model structure here, that is one f orbital and one c orbital with hybridization between the two. But then you also see a t perpendicular and this is again a dispersing band. So, this is the third orbital. So, it can be thought of as a three orbital model. So, uh, what I said in the beginning was there is another way to visualize the same bilayer model and this kind of a representation gives you that kind of a visualization. Basically, this is a three orbital model. So, you can think of it as a periodic Anderson model once again with three orbitals per unit cell where two of the orbitals are uncorrelated and form a band, but the hybridization is only with one of those bands and the second band is hybridizing with the first band. So, uh, with this kind of an equivalence, one can think of a 3D or a higher dimensional generalization of the bilayer model, okay. So, one does not have to be restricted to two dimensions. In fact, the approximation that we will be using that is dynamical mean field theory, which reduces this lattice model to a one site to a single site approximation, allows us to make this equivalence even more precise. Okay, so uh, we will be looking at some simple limits first. So, the first limit to look at is uh, the particle hole symmetry and in this if we make the interactions on the f side 0 and also the hybridization to be 0, then what we have is independent layers, three independent layers and uh, uh, the f layer becomes a pure Mott insulator because there is no hopping allowed there. But then we have a metallic bilayer system if we allow a hopping between the two metal layers. But if we go on increasing the metal, the hopping between the layers, surprisingly this metallic bilayer system becomes a band insulator. So, this entire system becomes a Mott insulating F layer plus a band insulator, okay. So, this is one of the limits. Now, <coughs> we can look at the limit when we turn on the hybridization between the C level and the F level and then still keeping the interactions to be 0, we find a surprising thing which is that the F electron system which was earlier completely gapped now acquires a finite density of states, okay. So, in the usual periodic Anderson model, the condo insulator has a gap both in the f spectrum in the f density of states as well as in the c density of states. Whereas, here by coupling a third conduction band, the f system acquires a non-zero density of states, which means it becomes a metal. This is all at half filling, half filling particle of symmetry. So, uh, yeah, so uh, this, uh, whereas the conduction bands uh, at the same time acquire a gap, they do have a gap, but that gap becomes quadratic rather than a hard gap, okay. So, it, uh, the gap has a structure which is omega squared close to the Fermi level rather than having a pure hard gap. And what this means is that the effective bandwidth of the F site is V squared over T perpendicular squared, okay. So, this allows us to make a conjecture on a possible mod transition in this system. So, what we saw in the Hubbard model case within dynamical mean field theory was that if the interaction over the bandwidth crosses a value of the order of 1, in, in that calculation it was 3, then, then you can have a mod transition. So, here also we can make the same kind of a speculation that if we turn on an interaction which is of the order of this effective bandwidth, we could have mod transitions in the system. But what that also means is that we have a whole surface of mod transitions 
because we could tune the either the v or the t perpendicular or the uc in order to see this mod transition. So, uh, with this we can go on to looking at what is the framework that we are using to solve this model. So, remember these these conclusions are all independent of any approximation. Uh, now, we can go into what are the approximations we are going to use in order to solve this model. And the first thing we will do is to define a framework which is dynamical mean field theory. And uh, uh, in this framework the lattice model in d dimensions reduces to a problem of a zero dimensional correlated impurity which is embedded in a self consistently determined bath. So, and what the, uh, this effectively means that we are looking at a local approximation for the self energy and uh, this is the main simplification that happens that the self energy becomes local spatially or it becomes momentum independent in momentum space. And if you are looking at the calculation of Kubo conductivity then you do not have to consider vertex corrections. And in this limit one can find the f greens functions uh, f greens function exactly and it looks like this. So, we will go into the more conclusions with this. So, uh, to explain dynamical mean field theory schematically what we are doing is taking a lattice and then mapping this whole lattice problem into a single side problem which is hybridizing with an effective medium. And the uh, challenge here is that the effective medium is not known a priori before we start the calculation we do not know what is the effective medium right. So, to calculate this effective medium we have to do a self consistent uh, iterations. So, the uh, we start with some uh, self energy known self energy either a previously found self energy or a zero self energy. Then uh, solve an impurity problem find the uh, find the impurity self energy and that gives us a, a whole self consistent cycle. So, uh, this uh, dynamical mean field theory is quite old now uh, and uh, it is very well established. But then uh, obviously, the main approximation in dynamical mean field theory is that you are ignoring all spatial fluctuations. Okay. So, uh, it is a it is a mean field theory, but it is dynamical. So, the hybridization is still time dependent okay. and it is a uh, it is a frequency dependent hybridization which is why it is called dynamical mean field theory. So, uh, uh, within dynamical mean field theory we can look at a Fermi liquid limit of the same problem which is defined as uh, as as follows. Basically, what we are doing here is that we can do a Taylor's expansion of the self energy about the Fermi level. And uh, the, in this Taylor's expansion the real part of the self energy uh, has only a linear term uh, and uh, sorry the imaginary part of the self energy does not have a linear term. And uh, with this kind of a uh, uh, Fermi liquid uh, or a Taylor's expansion of the self energy one can find out what is the low frequency behavior of the spec of the density of states exactly. So, here what we see is that there is a omega squared behavior of the conduction band which means that the hard gap becomes a soft gap and the f density of states acquires a non zero value. But not only that the non zero value is actually connected to the non interacting limit as well. Okay. So, this means that there is actually adiabatic continuity to the non interacting limit. And if you look at a mod insulating limit then the self energy should have a mod pole. And again the low frequency expansion tells us that if one wants to obtain a mod insulator then the necessary condition is that the interlayer hopping must be bigger than the band width. So, with these limits we can go into the full numerical solution, but the full numerical sol solution requires us to find a self energy and finding the self energy is one of the biggest challenges. So, for that we use uh, there are various methods that are available. For example, quantum Monte Carlo exact diagonalization NRG NCA IPT and LMA. These methods are exact and uh, numerically exact I mean uh, but extremely computationally intensive and these methods are based on diagrammatic perturbation theory and uh, have their own limitations in terms of summing either a set of whole diagrams or truncating the diagrammatic expansion. So, uh, of these methods we have chosen the local moment approach because uh, of many reasons. I uh, will come to that in a minute before uh, before that I will describe the local moment approach. So, it was developed in 1998 by David Logan and co-workers for solving the single impurity Anderson model. So, the main ingredient is diagrammatic perturbation theory. So, it employs uh, diagrammatic perturbation theory and unlike usual perturbation theories which start with the non interacting Green's function starts with the static unrestricted Hartree Fock mean field theory. So, which implies that we will have a doubly degenerate local moment state 
and for each of these uh, degenerate local moment states one builds a self energy using trans using a summation uh, to all orders of the transfer spin fluctuation diagrams and this incorporates dynamics now there are further steps in this involving symmetry restoration and Luttinger's theorem conservation but I am not going into the details of that but the good thing about this approach is that it reproduces the exact bond of scale in strong coupling and also the Wilson ratio and uh, uh, detailed benchmarks have been obtained to show that the density of states as obtained by Lemme is uh, compares excellently with NRG. So we can have a lot of confidence in this approach and we can use this to solve our model. <coughs> and uh, diagrammatically this is what uh, it does, this is the transfer spin polarization propagator and the lines here instead of it being non-interacting Green's functions are actually unrestricted hartree fock Green's function, shifted although. So uh, this is the first result of our work. So what you see here is energy scales and this is the interlayer hopping. So I will come to what the energy scales are. So you can think of the energy scales in this problem as being proportional to the quasi particle weight or the condo scale in the problem which is also known as a coherent scale in the periodic Anderson model context. So uh, uh, what you see is that with an increase of T perpendicular this energy scale is decreasing monotonically. And beyond a certain T perpendicular, what you see is that the, the, there is a gap in the system which also increases uh, uh, monotonically. And if we plot this energy scales on a log scale with uh, linear T perpendicular, both the scales go to 0 at exactly the same point, which is not exactly at 1, it is shifted from 1. And we have verified this numerically. So what this is telling you is that there is a Fermi liquid below this T perpendicular which is a coherent Fermi liquid with a certain scale, characteristic low energy scale and then there is a gap in the system beyond that T perpendicular and both these scales go to 0 which means there is a continuous mod transition happening in the system as a function of T perpendicular. Now we can try to see if the same thing happens with interaction strength. So uh, we do find the same picture here, the energy scales as a function of interaction strength for, uh, uh, for a fixed T perpendicular also go to 0 at the same u. Okay. So as a function of T perpendicular and u, we can see continuous mod transitions. So using this, we can vary parameters in the whole uh, space and then look at the phase diagram of the system. So this is interlayer coupling T perpendicular and this is interaction strength. And what you see here is a line of uh, uh, continuous mod transitions. And these arrows represent either going in, in direction of increasing T perpendicular with a fixed interaction strength or going uh, in the direction of increasing interaction strength as a for a fixed T perpendicular. And we get the same points, so the red points and the black points correspond to these two directions. And if we vary the hybridization V, we can get two different lines, which means if we had a third axis here, this line would develop into a surface of continuous mod transition. Okay, so uh, this basically demonstrates that this model does exhibit a whole surface of continuous mod transitions. Next we can ask what are the uh, characteristics of each of these phases. Okay. So uh, first we will look at the Fermi liquid phase. So this is showing the F density of states, the scaled F density of states as a function of frequency, again a scaled frequency. And if you look at the inset first, here we show the bare density of states where there is no scaling involved of the x axis and you see that the central peak here shrinks exponentially. Whereas if I go to the main panel where I have rescaled the f density of states as well as the frequency axis, there is a universal collapse. So this is showing that, not, this is showing not only that the f density of states is uh, a universal function of omega over the low energy scale, but it is also showing that there is adiabatic continuity to the non-interacting limit, although I have not plotted the non-interacting limit here. And the same thing happens as a function of uh, varying T perpendicular as well. So any way you approach that line of continuous mod transitions, you do find universal scaling uh, uh, as a function of omega over the low energy scale. And in the mod insulating phase, uh, what we find is that the entire all the three layers actually develop a gap. Okay. So, 
uh, this is showing the three different layers the periodic Anderson model, the F and the metallic layer and all the three layers in fact develop a, a gap and uh, this is saying that uh, the entire system becomes a Mott insulator rather than a decoupling of the layers and then only the F layer becoming a Mott insulator and the other layers remaining metallic. Okay. So and the gap is also the same in all the three layers. So. <coughs> With this I will conclude and uh, what I want to say is that we found a, uh, a whole surface of continuous mod transitions in this bilayer condoinsulator metal model and uh, we like to think of it as a bilayer condoinsulator metal model because this gives access for experimentalists to tune a parameter which is the interlayer coupling to uniaxial pressure and that can probably realize this kind of a system. But then for calculations it is probably better to think of it as a two conduction band periodic Anderson model because it uh, makes the DMFT approximation more valid. And these transitions involve vanishing of the coherent scale on the metallic side and of the gap on the Mott insulating side. And we also find uh, adiabatic continuity and universal scaling in the metallic phase. And this is uh, some future work that we, uh, I mean we want to see the relation to other models which involve condo destruction. For example, there was a work. Uh, uh, by uh, Stephen Kirchner and uh, co-workers on a double quantum dot system where they had considered a very similar model but in a local context what they considered was a correlated quantum dot, an uncorrelated quantum dot and a conduction band. So this is almost exactly what our model also reduces to because what we have is two conduction bands and a correlated F level. So but the relation is not entirely clear because what they find is uh, the that they, they can find a, a tuning of the hybridization from a usual hybridization to a soft gap hybridization. And we also need to do finite temperature studies to see if these are really quantum critical mod transitions to see at finite temperature where whether we do see any omega over t scaling and so on. So and that is it. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, so we have neglected the magnetic ordering completely. So this is uh, in within DMFT the local moment phase that you find does not have a quenched interval, the proper local moment. I mean which is an artifact but uh, we need to do, we should have done a uh, magnetically ordered phase. There is a very recent work by Skeletar and his group who actually uh, got to know of this work and followed it up. So I have not looked at it completely but they looked at again a 2D system and they have done. Um, Again, a numerical method, uh, Monte Carlo, but uh, determinantal quantum Monte Carlo, I think. No, it is a finite system of a lattice, of a 2D lattice, where they have considered magnetic ordering, but I am not completely sure about their results. Roger, w w when you uh look at the Mott transitions, presumably as in the periodic Anderson model, they could be both Mott-Hubbard-like and, and charge transfer-like, is, is that right? Have you? So in this I, I am, I believe that this is uh, Mott-Hubbard. Mott-Hubbard-like, so you are in that region. develops a pole. But you are continue, ah, ah, right, right, so, but will there on your surfaces be a sort of charge transfer-like? I mean the periodic Anderson model admits that. Right. If the epsilon C becomes sufficiently large. Right. In this case, we are considering purely the particle symmetric. Ah, yeah, of course. And that, therefore, I, I think interesting things will happen if you go away from that. Yeah. Definitely. Yes. In fact, we also try to look at the hybridization to see whether any soft gap Anderson model kind of universality is appearing here, but uh, we did not find that. Actually. It is still log squared tail. So, so is this uh, vanishing of the uh, coherence scale uh, or this energy scale which is plotted? Uh, uh, does it only, is it correlated with uh, a kind of metallic scale that is uh, an orbital symmetry or, um, or is it, uh, would it also exist if you sort of tweak the model so that both the conduction bands were actually symmetric? 
Uh, yeah, it's actually we can map this to a different kind of a model where the F, the conduction band, uh, or let's say a three layer model where the F layer is actually in between the two conduction layers. And even then, so it can be exactly mapped to that model actually. Okay. But this is not an orbital selective transition because uh, what I said is that all the three orbitals develop exactly the same mod gap. So it's not as if the F layer has got decoupled. Simultaneously, yes. So there is no orbital selective. I think it's between strong and weak and a condo. So there is no strict criterion to distinguish between a strong and a weak condo insulator, except the fact that you can look at, I mean, if you're looking at real systems, then um, you would look at the gap, for example, and if you find the gap to be of the order of milli electron volts, then you would say that this is like a very strong condo insulator, because the kind of interaction strength that you need, or the kind of low hybridization that you need is, uh, is beyond some threshold. Okay. It's, it's like in the strong correlation between. So what you're looking at there is like a U over Q times bandwidth over the V squared ratio, which determines the correlation strength. And if that is strong enough, then you would get a very strong renormalization of the band gap. But there's no strict threshold. 